Hello and welcome to the Overly Animated Podcast, where we take animation seriously. I'm Beatrice Murad, and today I'm joined by Michelle Anderer. Hello. And Alex Bonilla. Hey. Today we will be recapping the first two episodes of She-Ra Season 3, The Price of Power and Huntara, which dropped alongside the rest of the season a couple weeks ago. Um, warning, all of us have seen season three in its entirety. We will be discussing these episodes and how they interact with the rest of the season. So spoilers, spoilers, spoilers for everything in season three, but especially from these two episodes. Um, you can find out more about this podcast at OverlyAnimated.com. You can subscribe to us on iTunes at OverlyAnimated.com slash iTunes. You can find us on Spotify. The link is on our website. Or you can find us on YouTube at YouTube.com slash OverlyAnimated. All right, so, uh, Michelle, you were in the general reaction season three podcast, so I just wanted to very briefly take a little bit of time just to get Alex's just general thoughts of the overall season before we dive into these episodes. Oh, uh, well, I thought the entire season was really good. I I, I did listen to the, to the podcast that you guys had on the overall thing and I would agree with the general sentiment that this is probably the best season of the three so far just in terms of like how consistent the quality it was uh, season two like there were a couple episodes that are like eh, you could take a leave but like this one I feel like all episodes have some meaningful stuff some stuff that's fun and um seeing Katra continue down her spiral is both um alarming and compelling so uh, that 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 bring, it makes me very interested and um, we're like, continuing to sprinkle in some uh, some stuff uh, with uh, the o- overall story of etheria and shiron all that lore and uh, uh, and uh, i think that also it continues to be creative we'll try to spice spice things up especially once we get to remember we'll talk about like the formats and how how that's very out there so uh, i i just think that this uh, group of episodes has a lot of going on and uh, we'll talk about these specific too but as, as as a whole season i definitely really enjoyed it. it it kept me excited from beginning to end and i am very happy that she is back yes i agree um very very happy and i think the one of the biggest takeaways for me for this season is that unlike the previous season this one actually felt like it had closure or at least not closure in the sense of like there's like a beginning and middle and end but kind of like okay I'm right we are come we're starting a new chapter in the next season and doesn't feel so loose they're not as many loose ends or like yeah everything being and and, and it makes sense because this is the second half right exactly the natural season so it's like okay so we're like we're pushing it in the climax at the uh, in this part part which I'm, I'm fine with honestly like i like it kind of condensed like this and we have the first half being like kind of set up a little bit more meandry but when it comes when that comes le- leading into this so it, it feels natural enough yeah yeah um if anyone is has binged the season two and season three back to back let us know if season two flows better because i haven't had the time to binge it and then go straight into season three. But that's a fun experiment to do. Um, but let's get into these episodes. Let's start with episode one, The Price of Power. Um, we kick off right where we left off with Shadow Weaver in Adora's room. Um, Adora like just senses her presence and wakes up before Shadow Weaver can do anything. Um, but Shadow Weaver collapses on the floor. She is then held prisoner by the rebellion. Um, she's interrogated by Angela and Castaspella. I cannot get over that name, Castaspella. Castaspella. <laughs> I just cannot get over it. Um, uh, it's like that and Natasa. It's just those two names are the greatest. Um, also, no Natasa this season. That's some, well, like barely, not even. I don't think there's even, I don't know. There's just no Natasa and that's not good. Um, but yeah, so Angela doesn't get an answer out of her and neither does Casaspella. Um, and Shadow Weaver is only willing to talk to Adora. Um, and Angela quickly figures out that Shadow Weaver is dying. Now, here's a question. Is, do, did, did you, do you really believe the Shadow Weaver was dying? Like, yeah. Is, yes. 
Yes, yes because, like, do you? Yeah, you know, be sure just because, like, up until up until this point, every time dark magic has been used, it's come with a price. And to me, it makes logical sense that for as big an ask as she's trying to get this dark magic to to transfer her away from her prison cell to this entirely other location, like that's the price that it takes a huge toll on her body. And she's kind of old, and she's been in a cell for a long time, so she's not at her strongest when she's doing the spell anyway. That she would be getting close to death at that point. I mean, you saw all those like weird gray fumes coming off her. It just looked like she had this sickness and she kept coughing and all. I believed it. Look, looks can be deceiving. And wow. she what hell of an look, look, I'm just saying, I'm actress. just saying, every single time that there was like that there was like a moment where she needed sympathy she would be coughing <laughs> she would be collapsing like i'm just saying it was it happened too many times that it was a little convenient i was i i still have my reservations about shadow weaver and i feel like maybe she just used adora to power herself up and just become even stronger maybe she wasn't dying maybe she was weak but dying i don't know i don't know it just seemed a little Mm, I have my doubts, but, um, so yeah, so while this whole interrogation thing is happening, we have, uh, Glimmer and Bo trying to keep a door away from her. And eventually they, they, a door convinces them to help her. But, um, there's a very interesting kind of interaction between Glimmer, Bo and Adora where Glimmer and Bo are kind of like, she's from the horde. We can't trust her and blah, blah, blah. And Glimmer says something really interesting. She says, evil people don't change. Yeah. Now, if if we are going to go down the Catra getting redeemed part, how Glimmer, how do you how would Glimmer react to that? Based on what she says here, I don't <laughs> think she's she's not gonna be happy, I feel like, of any horde person switching. Right. And I think that also feeds into how she reacts with Shadow Weaver because she's in the same place that, that you are, Beatrice, of being suspicious of every single action that Shadow Weaver is taking because, hey, she's from the Horde, so she's evil. So everything she does ha- is for bad, right? And so because, and Adora is from the perspective of, well, maybe she's changed. And like, that's a, she's willing to, to hear her out. But, and so I think that a simple, what we saw in this episode with how Glimmer reacts to Shadow Weaver versus how Adora reacts to Shadow Weaver, I think it'll be very similar if we ever get to that point with Catra, where like Adora is, especially considering how the season ends, Adora is going to be firm with Catra, but if she notes that there's change, she might be willing to hear her out. Whereas Glimmer is going to be very on the side of, well, how do, how do we know we can trust her? You know, because that's just kind of her person personality to be very suspicious of a lot of things to the point where like it's, it feels very weird that she finally gives in to shadow weaver at the end of the season but it's more out of desperation than anything but if it's up to her she's not gonna accept katra right right i mean i guess but like i i, I just i'm always on the boat that glimmer is the one that's gonna really really get through to katra so i don't know i've just I mm. guess, like, I don't know, this is, this is a very interesting interaction, um, and Glimmer kind of seems to be, uh, oftentimes, I don't know, she just seems to be, like, the, very firm in her beliefs, and I'm just very curious, since Ketra, granted, this happens later on the season, but, like, just how deep Ketra goes into the darkness, um, and everything, but it's just gonna be, Interesting that like that line I just felt like was very much foreshadowing maybe possibly of how Glimmer is going to respond if not even to Catra maybe even to Scorpia or just to anyone from the Horde yeah. or even just Entrapta turning back because it's like does she consider Entrapta evil because she didn't start in the Horde but she's helping the Horde so it's like I feel also like Glimmer she's spent most of her life like in her kingdom. I don't think she has the most open mind to the to the complexities of like what switching sides means for a person. But even in the next episode Hantara was also a deserter from the horde right. and she essentially changes to be on their side. So, like, clearly it is possible. It's not just Adora being she that makes it possible for other people. So I'd like to think that she could come around. But I think, like, the way she just, like, 
very flippantly is like, no, like if you're evil, you stay evil. Nobody changes. Like, sure, some people don't change. But is that true of everyone? It's probably circumstantial. So I'm sure, like, something's going to happen to change your mind. Right. Be it Catcher or somebody else. We'll see. But I feel like, yeah, they wouldn't have had that line there if they weren't going to do something about it later. Right. Right. I know. I was just, I was, I was, because Adora was, like, I felt like that was the lesson. It's like, look, Adora switched. She's not that bad. There might be people from the horde. They're not that bad. And it's like, no, she still has ways to go. And that was that was an, that was like a, an interesting kind of reveal, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a, accompanying that line as well, Bo is like, "Well, th- th- that's different. You're not like them." So, like, also like kind of like trying to find exceptions to be like, oh, yeah. well, "Look, the four people are bad, but you're special. So it's fine right. with you. But like everyone else is terrible." And so, like that also that that's like a very common form of language to use in like discriminate discriminatory situations where it's like right I, i'm fine with you but like the rest but of the everybody people, else so, yeah right, so like right. I, I find it interesting that bo says that it's like, i feel like bo doesn't have the bo in in especially in season one like bo is the one that's most open to adora like uh, she's the one he's the one who's who's beginning to like get conversation out of her so i find it interesting that here we give Bo that line. It, it stood out to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Sorry. Sorry, Michelle. What were you gonna oh, say? just like I think like maybe a key difference that Glimmer and Bo are missing is that so, to them being from the Horde equals being evil. But being evil is totally up to like, you know, it, that's a personal thing. And I don't think there are plenty of people in the horde right now. Like I'd argue like if someone's going to switch, if it's not Scorpio, maybe Kyle. I mean, it sucks for him <laughs> oh, being Kyle. in the horde. He doesn't seem like a bad guy at all. <laughs> Who's Kyle? Feel like, yeah, Kyle. Kyle? Oh, <laughs> Poor goat lady later. Yeah. But like, yeah. I think like, so when Bo meets Adora, he's like, oh, she seems she seems legit and honest and wants to do right. And like, I'm getting that vibe from her. So she must not be evil. And therefore like, I will trust her. But what he's forgetting is like, they've linked this idea of the horde to like a blatant evil anyway. And that assumption I think is like, again, because like they haven't really encountered anyone from the horde who hasn't been against them until Adora. So they're very inclined to, to just like merge those two things together, like horde and evil. But obviously the show has shown us like it's a lot more complicated than that. So I feel like they're they're both gonna have to be confronted with that at some point in the yeah. future. And Adora's already questioning it for them. So yeah. the groundwork I, is here to explode yeah. this theory of theirs. I mean, I'm just surprised. Like after, they've spent so much time together with Adora. Obviously, she's talked to them about like life in the horde. And they know the Shadow Weaver even at one like seemed to even like just treat just being raised by Shadow Weaver seems to be kind of a brainwashing type of thing. So it's kind of like, I don't know, I was just surprised, not in terms of like, obviously because it's Shadow Weaver, it's like they're obviously treating it in a different way, but it's like, it's interesting how they take like anyone from the Horde is evil when it's like, yeah. well, Adora, like, I feel like these are conversations that they should have already had with Adora. They spend enough time together, I feel. Um, Although, like, to, to be fair... Adora's general impression of Shadow Weaver is as abusive mom, and if totally, that's the totally. only thing they hear about Shadow Weaver, you're like, then yeah, it she makes, must be evil. Yeah, then totally. their idea of, oh, hey, we gotta keep you away so she doesn't manipulate you, is a very valid uh, totally. worry to, to have, totally. with, I just with, be- considering her history. And that's why I find this episode so fascinating because the show has done so much to make Shadow Weaver a very suspicious character. So now finally like seeing her say things that like we know are true and we can tell that she's desperate and also we already know that she is attracted to power and Adora has power and like that's good enough of a motivation. Mm -hmm. So like it's very interesting because uh, the show has built up to a point where you're supposed to believe like Glimmer does Shadow Weaver would has to be lying about this stuff. Like, why would she be telling the truth? Just show up randomly and like tell us the truth and be like, "Hey, here's the weakness." Like, that doesn't make sense. But right. Shadow Weaver is in such such a specific place based on like what we've learned of her character that it kind of also makes sense that she'd be telling the truth. So, uh, Shadow Weaver is a, a very complicated character, and I love her in this episode because of the fact that like you can totally take both sides of. Uh, of believing her and you be- and you understand both both Adora's side of wanting to believe and Glimmer's side of why should we believe 
Right, Plus, right. like, yeah, like, the, and I think the thing that's really cool about Shao Weaver is, like, at the end of the day, she's good at playing both sides of this because her, she is only really concerned about herself. Like, she right. wants to align herself with the most powerful person in the room at that particular moment. Mm-hmm. And she's totally willing to flip flop. Like, she has no allegiance to a side. She has an allegiance to herself, but she also has this belief that, like, she's never going to be powerful enough on her own. She's always seeking out somebody bigger and stronger to support, to succeed with. And, like, that's what, like, yeah so like of course she can tell the truth sometimes like if it serves her purpose but like oh that's so crafty it's like amazing and I'm honestly like so glad that Shadow Weaver is such a big part of this season because I was kind of afraid we were going to get rid of her after you know Shira like pulled her off or something but no she's sticking around for season four and I'm sure she has like big plans for Glimmer and I'm just like so excited like obviously worried but also so excited she's such an interesting character see but that's interesting everyone everyone likes everyone's focusing on her potential influence on Glimmer but she influenced Adora too like even though Adora yeah. said that 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 uh, and granted Adora has more experience dealing with Shadow Weaver she knows thing. her better than Glimmer yeah she knows her but... way better but I'm just I'm just interested in seeing like if this is if they're going kind of like she's like infecting their minds or whatever. It's like she's also had her hands on Adora, not just Glimmer in terms of like messing with like amp like I don't know what's the word like amplifying amplifying their powers mm-hmm. or like guiding yeah. them. So it's just like I, it's I'm curious to see how both of them deal with it because I'm thinking she's gonna be aiming at both of them and then we'll see how that goes. Oh man. I just yeah. my mind just went real dark. I was like, you know, oh, I was like, happened. yeah, maybe she could use Glimmer to get to Adora because yeah. I don't. I, at this point, I don't think she can get to Adora on her own because Adora like lays it out for her this episode. Yeah. She's like, I I will help heal you if you make this promise to me, but also promise me that I will see through you, that I will not believe any of your lies, and believe that I'm like smart enough to to stop whatever mind games you try. And I think Shadow Weaver knows, like, she's onto her and she's not gonna, she's not, like, a little kid anymore. Right. So, yeah, she, she would have to use Glimmer to get her to do what she wanted. And, like, maybe she'll succeed there. Because Glimmer doesn't know her that well. She doesn't yeah. know her tricks yet. Her mom's gone, so she's vulnerable. Oh, man. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it'll happen. Who knows? But um, we'll find out soon. But speaking of uh, Shadow Weaver, um, she, as we mentioned, she does help Adora kind of unlock her healing powers because Adora's never gotten it to work before. Um, And she says something really interesting. Well, she says a couple of things that are pretty interesting. One, something that we already know, princesses have rune stones um, and She-Ra's is her sword. Like, it's in her sword. Um, And it's where she channels the elemental magic of Etheria. Uh, I I, I think I've asked this question in previous podcast but I, I still want I don't have an answer what is a, what is Entrapta's rune stone like oh, she's a princess God, I don't know like is it her hair like what is it <laughs> Maybe it's her brilliant science brain. brain. It's her brain, maybe that that might be it. Um, the the universe brain. knows that she can hack the planets. It's like you don't need a rune stone. You could just <laughs> you're, you're good. plug you're in whenever you need it. Too smart. You don't get a rune stone. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't I'm, know what a rune stone is. It's a good question. I'm, I'm just like, if she's considered a princess, she should be having a rune stone. And it's like, where is it? Um, but yeah, so beside that, jokes aside, um, Shadow Weaver does say, like, there there must be peace in your mind to heal. And I'm like, this is, I feel like, another quote, another line of dialogue that I feel is also a lot of foreshadowing. I'm calling it now. She Ra's gonna have to heal the planet, and it's Uh-oh. gonna be like this final epic moment where she's gonna, or not even the planet, let's go bigger. She's gonna heal the universe and you know, like heal time and space. And that's gonna be representative of of her finally at peace with herself and her powers. Calling it now. What do you agree with this theory? Uh, I mean, it seems seems likely. Um, I'll also say that the first part of that quote, where it's frustration causes your energy to be destructive, I think could also be foreshadowing for something. See, I, I mean, yeah, but we kind of knew that with Mara. Like, we already kind of figured that yeah, out. Uh, so it's like, yeah. You know, we're, like, inst- instability causes destruction. And we don't know if 
Mara destroyed the like obviously we can't trust Light Hope, so maybe that's not what happened with Mara either, though. Okay, but we kind of have to okay, like here's the thing about Light Hope. We have to kind of trust her <laughs> yeah. at some point. Because it's like if we're gonna question Light Hope being like, okay, we can't trust what she says about Mara, then how are we gonna trust her for being the one to confirm what Shadow Weaver reveals, which is that Adora is from another planet? Like we use Light Hope as a source of like confer- confirmation of like yes, you are a first one. Okay, right? so she ha- she's good at facts, but she's bad about objectivity because she has her she own perspective. So mm. No, she doesn't though. It's- because okay. yeah, because Mara did what she did to to help the planet, but her being like emotional was seen as like a danger to Light Hope. Because when she like when Adora gets upset, she's like, "You're behaving erratically. It's happening again." Mm. Like she she doesn't understand how humans work. She couldn't even comprehend that Adora couldn't remember being a baby and what she experienced as an infant. Like there there are some serious blind spots that Light Hope has as a projection hologram, and it's totally showing. So she can be right about certain facts, but I think she definitely still has like this really erroneous logical perspective that the past two she have not agreed with, I'm just saying. So there's something there. Biased narrator, basically. Like yeah. she, she's telling stuff that happened, but she's giving it from a very specific perspective that may not be showing uh, the full context of situations. Right, right. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Well, Ta- speaking about like light, light hope the end of because we're right now we're only focusing on like the plot a of of the episode which is all the stuff that's happening with the rebellion with adora and her crew um and there's like this fascinating piece of dialogue between light hope and adora and this is why i love chosen one narratives yeah. because it's it is the ah. it's like it is it is the constant tension and friction of don't I get a choice? No, this is your destiny. You are chosen. You don't get a choice. You are chosen. And it's like that tension. And I love how they framed it because the way that they use Light Hope, who is this kind of, you know, she's a robot. She's a hologram. She's a computer. She is um, colder. She's detached. It's like she, and, and, you know, there is this kind of idea where it's like, because she's all logic, it seems like, you know, it's like, there is no room for emotion. So it's like, a, this is how it's supposed to be. This is what an unbiased perspective is. It's like, it's your destiny. There's nothing to stop it. And here you have Adora being like the human, the emotion just being like, I want to be in control of my destiny and not having that choice. Um, So I found that to be like just a plus and just in terms of storytelling, the way that they created that interaction was wonderful. Um, And through that kind of anger, um, Adora decides that, sh- no, I'm going to go to the Crimson Waste. I'm going to try and find the message that Mara left or follow the message that Mara left behind. And, you know. Yeah, she, she, she wants to make she wants to make an informed decision. And when she asked Light Hope point blank, what, why did Mara do what she did? All Light Hope says to her is that's not important. Right. And so like, I wouldn't want to make an executive choice as a Shiro without getting the full context either. Right. Right. So and I think it makes total sense. No, totally. It makes sense. And it's, and uh, like Adora says, she's like, I'm finally taking control. At least. Yeah. And you know, Adora has been, always kind of been afraid to either I feel like Adora is a character that she wants control but she's also terrified of what the responsibilities of that yeah. be as and doing it wrong is, right because by taking control you are accepting the responsibility of this power so it's mm-hmm. like she's this is like a this is a, a great kind of moment for her as a character where it's like okay she's she's taking she's deciding what she wants to do which is great as it's ta- it's her first step in in, in taking on that responsibility of she and being comfortable with it. But here's a question. She is a first one. She talks about how she wants, she even mentions like, can, is there a way I can go back? Is there a way I can go back and meet my family? Like go back home? She refers to whatever planet she's from as home. And so here's, here's a question. Like, will she want to return home at the end of all this? Like, what do, based on this kind of revelation, 
what does this mean for Adora moving forward? Is it is this going to become like the new conflict for her rather than it being her her constant struggle with with embracing the title of Shira is it now going to be should I stay in this home that was that I did should I return to the place that I was born into or should I stay here? Like where do you see Adora going forward with this new conflict? Alex um, well, I, <laughs> see, it's, it's weird because, <laughs> uh, because Adora is an alien, um, with, uh, that, that's, that, that in itself is information to process, and Adora herself is very disturbed by this information when she first gets it, uh, so I think that it's probably gonna be in her head that, especially now that, like, by the end of the season, we've, like, introduced so, like portals exist like time space has been bent so it's like okay this can all happen so i uh, that's well, probably a thing i definitely think we're gonna do something where it's like hey but home is where people care about you yeah. and it's like glimmer and bow and all your princess friends are here so like just don't forget about us when you think about home so we'll, we'll have that whole thing but i definitely think that there's also a, a part Part of her that's gonna be like well i at least want to know like what happened like as, as with this episode right like she decides to go to the crimson waste just to have the information to like be, be able to know and uh, th- that's been her character throughout the entire thing like once she realizes there's things that she doesn't know it's like okay well i need to go figure out what these things are and like that's kind of been her whole her whole ethos throughout this show so I, now that she knows this, I, I, I'm pretty sure that that is something we're going to get along. Although I don't think it, it will be, like, the main thing because, like, she has stuff going on at home right now, especially with, like, Horde Prime go, uh, about to show up. But, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 it'll be a thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Michelle, like, we, I, I guess I just I want to meet her parents. Michelle, I'm, are we going to meet her parents? Uh, I mean, Noel said, I think, pretty explicitly that He-Man's never going to be in this show. But He-Man is not her parent. He's her no, brother. No, he's not. He he's not her up. daddy. That's true. Um, I, I mean, like, I definitely see her learning more about wherever she came from and her lineage, but... I, I mean, if she if she had nothing else to worry about and she could just take time to go on a road trip through space, I could see her doing it. But yeah, Horde Prime is a very immediate looming concern. And after that's all dealt with, I mean, I mean, yeah, once a theory is like in a stable place, which is like not happened in her lifetime, and like Limmer and Bo are holding down the fort essentially, I guess. But I feel like. I think we're we're like nowhere near ready to answer that question because I feel like we we still have to figure out like what exactly happened with Mara. How can right. they defend the planet? How can they stop the impending threat of Horde Prime? And what to do with Catra and the rest of the Horde? Like integrate them if they succeed or what? So I feel like very end of the season maybe, but I feel like there's no way she could take a road trip in the next two or three seasons and have that make, cause that'd be such an abandonment of like this greater concern that they need a She-Ra for. So unless she could like Skype call them or something, I don't, I don't see how she's <laughs> going to get D- a lot of answers Skype there. Call. Yeah. Dimensional <laughs> Skype call. Like if, unless she can do that, I can't see how that's going to work just because there's so many more pressing things that she has to take part in right now on Ethereum. Right. Right. I just, I just, I, I hope that we do, at least I know that th- there's a lot of more pressing matters, but I do hope that we do get some resolution of that reveal because whether it means finding out that she, that, that, I don't know, Prime just killed her parents or whatever it may be, or her planet was destroyed, whatever it is, I do want some closure because if if we if I just don't want Adora to become all about Shira and then Adora herself getting lost in it because that's something that we see that often happens and I don't want that to happen. I do want yeah. her to be both like be the selfless leader that does what she has to do for the sake of everybody, but also be able to be a little selfish and be like, yeah, but I do also want to find out who I am. So I do hope that we do get some closure. However, where in the series that happens, I don't know, but I do hope we get that. Um, but while all this is happening, 
with we have another plot happening with the horde we uh learn that cat we know that catcher's going to be sent to beast island um scorpia tries to help tries to help her get out but catcher being catcher pushes scorpio away um and this i think is really great foreshadowing for like the episodes to come like i feel like these in these moments where like you don't even think about it that much because it's such a small action in some ways it's like she does the same thing later in the season so it's kind of like if someone has a, a tendency to do something i feel like i know these little moments i feel like we have to pay attention to because it kind of gives insight into how a character is going to repeat that action later um so i thought it was a great character interaction but let's talk about scorpia here um she says you're my oh, friend. You're, uh. everything you're everything to me. To me. Which made oh. sent me red flags. So I was like, no, no, have more than one friend, Scorpia. Don't pin your hopes and dreams on one person, especially not if it's Catcher yeah, exactly. right now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> She's not a good choice. Yeah. Yeah. But this, it was think, very sweet and very gay. Yeah. I mean, this is a perfect example of something that Dylan mentioned in the reaction podcast um which is that the show is using friendship in place of romance i think this is like of all the moments this is like one of the biggest like places where it's like look i have a lot of friends but like i don't tell my friends you're yeah that's what i like i I know dylan wants it to be more explicit but i feel like again like these are teenagers they're figuring it out and like all good romance is built on good friendship so i especially because none of them are really paired off yet like none of the teens are really dating except for natasa and spinnerella so i mean i'm okay with them just like kind of feeling out their relationships without being like because like it wouldn't make sense for scorpio to be like i love you because catcher's like not ready to reciprocate that right, if anything right. like he's not like dense enough to not see that too so she's just she's trying to say it in a way that like catcher can get but like she also tried to ask her out on a date last season so it's not like she's not being explicit at the same time right right i will say you say teenagers but the same thing happens with the greatest shape that is. Oh, wait, oh, oh, yes. wait, hold, hold. save yourself, save yourself. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, before, I, I, I am, don't worry, I am holding back so much. So <laughs> don't worry, I, I'm just This is what I've been waiting for. Don't but, hold back. <laughs> well, we need to get through Catra in this episode at least. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> But I will say, like, you know, if this isn't it isn't something that just happens with teenagers. This is something that two adults, yes, yeah. two adults, yeah. people, two yeah. adults. Yeah, this is what sure. two adults also are being, it's being used with them as well, you know, who are using friendship instead, where the show is using friendship instead of romance. But so, so while I agree, at least yeah. in the context of, 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 uh, of Scorpia and, and, most of the princesses, like, yeah, I, like, right now is not the time for romance. And I agree, like, I don't think this is the, at this moment, no one is really ready for romance, except for our Back lovely couple. Ready, <laughs> so ready. Build so him ready. all the suits of armor, please. Make him feel powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, he feels powerful. She's like, how does it feel? He's like, Powerful, like just a little flexy flex. Uh, okay, before we get to all that, at least Alex in this, you if, gotta embrace this. Well, look, look, and then, uh, in this first episode, there's a little bit of Hordak and Entrapta because Entrapta yeah. is the one who convinces Hordak to be like, hey, He's just send Catra to go fetch us our tech. Like, that would right. be fine, right? And Hordak is open enough to, or Entrapta especially, they're like, Hmm, you got a point. <laughs> I just love how Entrapta, whenever, she, one, she doesn't back down from a confrontation. She never but backs down. It's so Never good. backs down, which is so great. But she's also like, she's also logical. like, the, she's so logical. Like, you never want to fight Entrapta because she's backed by science. Like, she yep. will have numbers and charts and statistics Four. throwing at you. 400%. That's how 400%. much Catra has improved the horde. What a statistic. That just blows me away. And, and the way she, like, slyly leaves that computer on Hordak's desk as she's walking away. Yeah. It's like, hey. And, and I just... 
I just love how she is so logical and Hordak is so like she he's controlled by emotion while she is so logical. It's like a, they're perfect. He admires perfect, that, I, I bet. Yeah, I, I'm sure he admires that about her. He's like, and she has a lot of good points, man. And I have to, uh, anger problems, but like, wow, she she's just a cool head and I admire that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so she convinces Hordak. I mean, we get to see a glimpse of Catra again. She did push Scorpio away because that again, makes sense. Is, no, no, no. I mean, this she's Catra, but also this is right after Shadow Weeper has burnt her again for like the hundred and twentieth yeah. time. Yeah. And that was the last person she wanted to trust. So of course she's pushing away this other person who's like, well, yeah, what has friendship and trust gotten me in a cell? It always backfires. Adora left me, Shadow Weaver left me. If I trust Scorpio, she'll probably leave me too. So, he, like, I think a, that makes sense yeah. that she would uh, Here's a question, though. Here's a question. Do Can you read her pushing Scorpio away? Because I think they do, like, play it off as, like, Scorpio plays it off as that. And I don't know if it's later in this episode or in the next one. Or in the in episode three, because they're not in episode two. Um, where she Scorpio is basically like, Oh, you did that to like protect me because you No, she says me. that. She's cause she when when Catra is telling her to go away, she's like, like, you better leave now or the like the guards will get you. And and right, I think like that right. there's there's an argument to be made for her being like, I don't wanna see you get in trouble, but right. I'm also definitely not going with you, so please leave of your own accord right now. Right. I feel like it's 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 also, I feel, I just think Ketra is just dealing with so much self-loathing. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. just she thinks, and it's interesting, there's an interesting parallel between Ketra and Hordak, where it's, they both are trying to prove that they're not worthless, that they are worth something. And Ketra is just, like, they're in different places in that journey of self-worth. But um, with Kedra, it's like, she, I feel like part of her, oh man, I was just about to make a link with Fruits Basket and the whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's just got a lot of broken people. Yeah, lots of (laughs) self-loathing. Self-loathing and, yeah, anyway. um, But, you know, she she does, she does, um, I feel like she is... She doesn't just push people away because of her desire to seek revenge on Adora and bring oh, the world she's to to what it is. She's worthy. Yeah. yeah. She I does think like she's worthy. Yeah. Catra, like at her core, I feel like she like she and Hordak are fighting so hard to prove themselves because I think deep down they still believe those bad things about themselves. Right. It might be true. And that's the biggest problem because if they believe it, they're doomed. Like they have to be the ones to pull themselves out. Like nobody can do that for them. And that's why it's so sad to see Scorpia trying so hard to reach out her hand, her her claw, rather, in support, because Katra needs to be in a place where she thinks she can deserve support, and she's so not there right now. And it's yeah. just, ugh. girl, yeah. figure yourself out, please. For yeah. your own yeah. sake. It's a, I don't know. It's just, I, I also find it so interesting how, how I mean, granted, I think it's also to do with age and maturity, but it's yeah. so interesting how Katra and Hordak, like, Hordak is so open to that the minute he gets it from Entrapta. And and, I mean, Entrapta doesn't even do it as overtly or as aggressively. Aggressive isn't the right word, but it's like as intensely as Scorpio in that Scorpio is such a source of of healing and just is so, like in terms of just like, she Scorpio is like the most ready for a relationship, I think. She's just (laughs) such a great partner. She's ready. She's so ready. She's so ready. And, And then, but then, and then with Entrapta, she's just like, but Hordak and Entrapta just go so well together that it's just there. It just happens. Whereas, I don't know, it's just interesting. I, I don't know, I, the I, parallel I, is really I know, I think, because like Hordak, I don't honestly think he's ever had a friend before. So he is kind of like fascinated by this new prospect. And Entrapta gives him this whole speech for why it's great to have friends and why he's being too hard on himself. And again, she's using logic to reason with him and it, it works perfectly. And he's like, all right, cool. I guess we're friends now. Whereas, I think Katra, she's had a friend and she got super burned by that friend, Adora. And so she's like, I think honestly scared about having new friends too, because she knows what 
the the flip bad side of that could be. And Hordak doesn't even have that perspective because this is his first one. So maybe that's part of why it's easier for him to accept, accept like Entrapta than for Kasha to accept Scorpio, like on any level, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, the, the parallel is interesting because Katra at the end of episode one like calls out Hordak and it's like, "Hey, you're the failure!" and like in front of everybody. Right. So yeah. that that like, that like hits Hordak where it hurts because like that's like the thing that he believes in himself, and Katra's the one to be like, "Yo, like you, you're you're a failure. Like you need me, and you have no idea how to run this place." So like that all like hits right at at like Hordak's weak spot and it's funny because Catra and Hordak are both suffering from the yeah, same it, issues it's, it's yeah like, she's like you think I'm a failure kiss what you also are failure and also suck how about that right right and unbeknownst unbeknownst to like unbeknownst to Catra but like Entrapta saves both her and Hordak uh, like isn't that so lovely like wow. Entrapta's just what a good friend, friend. She's awesome. Um, <laughs> let's let's move on to episode two. Oh, by the way, like I feel like the setup of like just Entrapta, just constant like she she's always helping Katra. So I feel like the betrayal later on in the season just hits that much more because she's done yeah. nothing but nice things for for Katra. Um, but yeah, so let's move on to episode two, Hantara. So. The episode opens, or so like the first, the plot A of the episode. So focusing on the squad. We have to talk about plot A. What do you mean? We can skip right to the meat if you want, Alex. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not right. fair. Wait, okay, hold on though. You are telling me you do not want to talk about the muscle gay <laughs> goddess that is Huntara. I mean, <laughs> she's fine. The story awesome. is. Uh, <laughs> you don't like it? Oh, it's fun westerny hijinks. It, exactly, it's very it's predictable. Oh, <laughs> so, it's fun, so, Alex. It's great. I mean, sure. we got both girl and lizard girl lackeys. This is fun time. Okay. I mean, look, but I'm I just mean, I'm just saying, like every time that they that they switched back to that, I was like, bring me back to the science people. I want to see that. <laughs> That's my compelling ship, but. The A plot's not that bad either. I'm just saying, Huntara saved the A plot. I'm just saying, <laughs> and that, that that's fair, yeah. And I mean, like, yeah, sure. Like the squad basically goes to a desert, then walks into the cantina from Star Wars. I mean, yeah. that's just something yeah. that happens. But um, and just the references are just—it's very clear. But I just want to, before we get into the joy that this pod. <laughs> will- Fine, fine. I just want to talk about one thing that that um really stood out to me from Tara's muscles from her arms. But, I mean, beside that, beside that, <laughs> beside Gina uh, Davis voicing her, like uh, flirt, oh my flirting God. with a waitress, it's oh, like a really it's hot something. waitress too, who was also really buff. Like, how is everyone just hot and buff in this universe? I mean, you I have to be buff there. to survive in the desert. That, that, that I guess that's the rule. Not buff. Well, she's not the like the alpha though. Maybe that's why. That makes sense. But I, there is something I, I. This is this is um something that really kind of stood out to me. What, okay, so Adora's like enthralled by Huntara, yeah. and some people are like, "Oh my god, she's got the biggest crush on Huntara." I don't see it as that. I see it as just complete admiration. Yeah, so, she admires her. There is a uh, there's a musical called Fun Home. I don't know if anyone's heard Fun of it. Fun Home, based- of course. Yes, and it's based on a, a comic uh, by the same name, Fun Home. Um, but in the musical, there is a song called Ring of the Keys. Keys. The Keys and, song, yeah. And the, the the song, and it's all about basically when the this young girl sees a, a butch a, a butch yeah. a butch woman for the for the first time. And she kind of, the young girl is just singing about how, like, how just seeing her, like, was so life-changing because it's just the, 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 it just proves that someone can exist in the way that she wants to exist. And I feel like Adora's enthrallment of Huntara is very reminiscent to me of that song and of that that message. Of just like this young person seeing someone that's older and seeing someone that's older and thriving and is exactly what they want to be. You yeah. know what I mean? And that to me, I don't know, I just found that to be really 
like and maybe it's because I don't know I just found that to be really striking and, and beautiful even though it's such a small little thing on the show making that parallel with that and fun home I mean it just confirms to me that Dora wants to be a very gay muscular goddess like Kentara. yes she's on her way man she's already here she'll get there one day there she'll totally get there she's oh man oh it's, it's probably it's, not on the same here. level but like you describing that reminded me of it in season one where Mermista sees she-ra for the first time and Mermista kind of like blushes too is like oh yeah. okay <laughs> because like I, 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 see a door doesn't blush her eyes just get all big and sparkly Right, right, right. But I mean, like, the, in, ter- in terms of like seeing somebody that's like stronger and like it's something to aspire to, it's like, oh, okay, this is cool, you know. So it's like the the effect that Adora that Shira has on others, she's finally able to receive it from someone else. So it's a good experience for her. I all, but I'm also saying, Mermista was it? I feel like Mermista wasn't Ring of Keys. She was more like smacked at by Akon. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I'm so glad y'all got that reference. I was like, what if none of them have heard that song? Oh, <laughs> the, the, the title is self-explanatory. That's also true. <laughs> but um, but yeah. Anyway, that is my crack ship, Adora and Mermista. Anyway, um, but speaking of ships, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Speaking of ships, they find Mara's ship at the end, right? Oh, who cares <laughs> yeah. about that? We got no, we're here for Hordak. <laughs> All right. So I just let me just preface this by saying that <laughs> <laughs> on the night of April 26th, <laughs> Friday, for those who are wondering, 16 minutes and 40 seconds into the recording of the she Season 2 Reactions podcast. Wow, seeps. <laughs> oh my god. I decided to open up about the possibility <laughs> of, <laughs> of a relationship between two characters and Michelle was there she was supportive <laughs> she was she was she was egging me on she was like yes 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 Dylan was horrified was it Dylan horrified? was horrified not, yeah, not horrified, horrified not horrified too. just very very surprised he was shook <laughs> surprised yeah he, he was, was shook and 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 Sam was like no why are you saying this and I'm like but but Hordak and Trapta and um and people were just like she's crazy she doesn't know what she's talking about this is never gonna happen and there was also the ambiguity about entrapta and who knows whatever all this stuff yeah so then this season drops and i get all (laughs) these tweets all these tweets from this person being like you gotta you gotta you you gotta watch it you gotta watch it and i'm oh my god so funny i'm on vacation i'm like trying to get tan i spoiler i don't (laughs) and then I lay down from my break and I start watching and the vindication (laughs) the 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 feeling of just complete righteousness and just like I was right I you know I am a writer I know when people are planting seeds I know the I know the point it's very hard to surprise me in movies and TV, because usually I'm very good at reading these things. But I don't often toot my own horn. You know, I'm like, you know, I, this isn't something to brag about, but in this instance, Do it. this is my moment. This is the longest victory lap of all. <laughs> no, it's crazy. <laughs> We're the to deserve it. They are, they are perfect. They are everything. They are the, the greatest thing to happen i want them to be happy and succeed and you're right michelle and trapped and made him powerful and made yes! him- <laughs> oh my god and like bitches i'll just say like this this is that uh, that half of the episode like i have i did not think this kind of thing would be possible only in the world of fan fiction but finally people old enough to be writing for for legit shows who would have earlier existed only on fandom forums are making shows and it, this is what the result it is so beautiful and just amazing and it's so like honestly even like kind of female gazy and like not in like a sketchy way but in just like he 
Like, Hordak is this big, powerful man, but he doesn't know how to have friends. And she's showing him how to be his best self. And he, like, faints. And she builds him a new armor. And he trusts her. And he validates her. And he affirms that she's not, like you know, a wrong, broken person either. And that's, like, all the sexiest stuff you could say to somebody. And it just works so well. I was, like, floored. And also, Beatrice, I had your your voice in my head the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was, like, imagining how you were going to be reacting. And it was pretty great. Uh, <laughs> like, and, well, yeah. Well, with regard, Michelle mentions like it's kind of female gazy. I think that what makes this relationship special is that in many cases, th- this this power dynamic doesn't work, right? Like you have the scientist who's in power and the assistant, the the, the female assistant. Like in many cases, that could come off as creepy, but because Entrapta is like being the most wholesome person ever, and it, Hordak is not not really taking advantage of the situation at all. Like it takes him oh, a while to get to get to that point, right? And Entrapta like slowly bre- breaks down his emotional armor. So like the the dynamic is so switched from what usually would happen in these situations in like other shows and, and movies. Uh, it, like it feels it feels so different, and it feels very earned when they when like Hordak finally. It's like the begrudging acceptance and like, and then like entrapped is like, well, I like being friends with you too. Like it feels like, ah, like the, yes. the work that, so like mo- most, there has been like bits and pieces before this episode, but the work done in this episode to get to that point is like so special. And it, it's the, it's just a very unique, unique relationship that it somehow works that like it somehow fe- feels great provided you can like take out of your head okay well this is like a robot person and like a small a small woman is <laughs> like there's like lots of factors like prevent people from being all in on, on this ship but if you no, can remove those factors and, and just look great. Like, how well, is uh, this okay but well, the, I'm just saying, like, it, the blonde lady's okay like what yeah, right, right. Like the, people have have yeah. different hangups, but um, all I'm saying is that if you can just focus on the personalities that are like meshing together in the, in these scenes, and the the t- the physical and the emotional and the, the verbal back and forth they have, this is a beautiful episode. For them Mostly, too. like not even just the personalities. I feel like they're like they're. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Like the the fact that Hordak is like like way taller, but she's the one who like presses him against yeah. the wall. <laughs> you have to tell me for science. Like there's something very attractive about like a, just a very short lady like like ordering this like like leader of an evil army around and pressing him against the wall. Like I, that is part of the appeal. It honestly is. And I'm so here for it. Or like when she's like feeding him, it's just like, there's something about that dynamic that's just like so appealing and we get it so rarely done well. And this is just a wonderful example of it being just like pushing all the right buttons for a person that would ship this. And I'm absolutely a person who would ship this at this point. (laughs) I'm sold, 100%. And can I just say also, I think in speaking about how often in media, this dynamic often is seen as creepy or male gazy. It just doesn't seem realistic. It doesn't seem like something that will work. And going in and how this show is kind of leaving into kind of a film, a female gaziness. It's Mm -hmm. interesting how for me it was, yeah, I can see a female gaze, but for me it was more... This is how that happens when the man respects the woman. No, that's your sense. No, it's like, true. Because- that's what female gaze is. It's just so respect. Yes! In a lot of ways. Yes! It's crazy because the male gaze is all about like objectifying a female partner and, and how they serve your bigger story. Right. Like, you are the center of your own fantasy, not them. But in a female gaze, it's all about like they affirm you and you grow together as people and you're a team and you're honest with each other and you support each other and you're both happy, which is like crazy that it's so much healthier. But like, yeah. That's why all the ladies love the Tarzan movie from, like, back whenever it was. Like, the live-action one. It's because, like, it's so female gazy and that, like, it's... He's, like... Okay, this is, like, a tangent. But, like, <sighs> the the supporting on both sides is a huge appeal 
for the female gaze. And that's something utterly lacking from a lot of male gaze stuff. And that's like such a key difference that this like yeah. points out really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I guess we, we shouldn't like push aside that like not only is Entrapped a supporting Hordak, but like Hordak is actually like giving out little pieces of support for Entrapped yes! too. Like throughout, throughout this, and that, help, that helps a lot. Like, it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Continue. Well, well, like in, in, the, in the middle, like, uh, Entrapped is like, well, I'm a failure. And like Hordak is like quick to chime oh, in, like, no, well, you're not a failure. Not. And, uh, yeah. gets like shut up, but it's like he was willing to like jump in there. And then at the end, like he gets to a place where he's like, yeah. I acknowledge the work that you put into this with help from the imp. He like goes on to be mo- more, uh, more, um, uh, outgoing with it with his compliments. It's for so it. dramatic. So, it's so well, hard. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, 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 it fits really his personality and stuff. And right. so, it's just like anyone who discounts you are utter fools. Like I'm yeah. utter yeah. <laughs> just like, thanks. I like also being your friend. I I get your drift there, poor awkward man. <laughs> it's just so it's so appealing. I love it. And and I don't know. And I think there's also I think for me the most female gaziness also of it beyond like all this other stuff is also there is something very kind of like attractive of nurturing someone back to health yes oh, like, sometimes yeah. it's like it's a, it's kind of like a, a, a like she like you see this guy who's like a, a, a the the, M, the leader of this mass army and then he's like super weak mm-hmm. and then this girl like this this woman just helps him regain his strength and he's able to show and it's interesting how it's like i mean and you see this with shadow weaver you saw how it's like she and I mean, granted, questionable for me because I don't know if she was really down. But um, <laughs> you, you, when you see someone vulnerable, suddenly you are more empathetic towards them. You're more mm-hmm. willing to. You more, not only are you more willing to open up to them, but they are forced to be more willing to let you in. And yeah. you know, she was, and then um, Entrapto was able to see Hordak in in in. And see, here's this is my thing. It's like. When I watched the Shadow Weaver, for instance, and her being all sick, I'm like, she's using this to her advantage. She's using the she's using her vulnerability of that moment as a way to manipulate others. With 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 uh, with Hordak, I didn't see that. I just saw. He's trying to hide it. He was trying to hide it, and I see this man just being vulnerable and allowing someone to see him vulnerable for probably the first time. And not only that, but knowing his backstory, how he was seen as a defect, how he was he was. A, like he was thrown out for being defective and for being weak, for being, we're having this problem. And to have Entrapped to see him this way, to have her help him, to have, to have her see him at his weakest at, when he feels he is at his most worthless and to see her not only that, but help him put him back together. Like to me, that's just, that was, that was very poignant, especially seeing his backstory and learning about that. Like it makes all these moments of this of this of this plot uh, plot B, I guess, of of this episode that much stronger. And it was just so tight. And it just really goes to show for people that you don't need things to be super elaborate or, or drawn super long for you to sell a romance, to sell a mm-hmm. connection or not even romance, connection. It's like it takes just these little moments. And like watching, I was like taking notes. I was like learning so much just from this little thing. I was like, they if you compare how much they've interacted with how much other characters have interacted with each other, yeah. they have that much time and that much screen time together in comparison. Yet it's the way that they just light up a screen together and it, it's just so enthralling. It just really shows not only the magic of creating two characters that gel so well together, but using them so effectively, which is like props to the show for doing that. Um, um, l- literally so light up, happy. literally light so up well. the screen when Trapta says like, imperfection is beautiful, at least to me. And then like oh, sparks are God. flying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like you, like, you, so you need to use that as a screen cap for this, uh, for this okay. podcast, because that is oh, the most romantic God. shot. See, <laughs> with like her kind of like leaning on his shoulder you know and oh, having her like hair i don't know which one to use i have so many oh but, yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, there's that one too 
too, right? It's like, thanks, I like being friends with you. And like, he, yeah, she has her hair on his, on yeah, his shoulder yeah. instead of her hair. I like that one. Yeah. But um, there's so many. But um, but yeah, but uh, something that's, that is interesting and worth, worth talking about. Um, so we have this like, like something I worry. And this is t- taking myself out of my love for them. Something that is interesting is how the show going forward, how the show is going to be able to treat them in comparison to, I mean, like, like pers- I'm, I'm trying not to be biased, but personally, I feel like this is the most romantic of all the, the, the relationships established at the moment. I feel personally, it's the most like overtly romantic of like doing all the cues. Maybe in the only other one is Scorpia and Catra, but the yeah. thing is Scorpia. Yeah, I, 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 I take is, that. I don't know. This is the one you want to root for, at least right now, because they have the healthiest foundation. They're they're in a place where they both kind of understand each other. They're mm-hmm. honest with each other. They're both reciprocating the friendship. That's already heads and shoulders above where Catra is with Scorpia, despite <laughs> Scorpia's best efforts at every turn. But like, so here's my thing. My thing is, taking out there there is you know we do need to discuss like they are like they are a heterosexual couple are mm-hmm. they will the show be able to go like for me my biggest worry is that the show because they've been so efficient with them and setting these things up very very being very quickly setting these things up it's like granted they're also the two adults of like the ships you know it's like they're they're not teenagers they're not figuring thing, trying to figure out their emotions and trying to grow up at the same time. Um, but it's like, will, there is a privilege there. There is a, a level of freedom that they have that maybe possibly other ships don't have. So it's kind of like something that's going to be interesting to see going forward is how the comparing how the show treats them with, and in, in terms of how much they show versus how much they show of other couples. Granted, the show itself it, with side characters, like very small characters, like you see Huntara being a gay goddess. You mm-hmm. see, you see Bo's dads, you know what I mean? But are we going to see with like the main staple relationships developing over time? If this is what, if this one's going to be treated differently than say others, granted, there are other things to consider as I mentioned, but that's something worth noting that, that I feel maybe it might be the only detriment for me is like, Oh darn. Like they, that the show may like go full on romance with them, but it might be, but they might not be able, to, it's going to be a reminder that they may not be able to do that with other ships because this one's heterosexual and others may not be heterosexual. So it's like worth noting. I keep- mean, I think that's super fair, but I will also say Scorpia asked out Catcher prior to this happening. Like that predates this. I think th- this is certainly culminating in a, I would argue, happy resolution quicker than anyone right. else. But I think that's also because they're not main characters. They're more side right. characters. And so their their plots don't have to be as nuanced and complicated. I think th- with the three or maybe even like five main, so Katra, um, Adora, Glimmer, Bo, and Scorpia, they are, they're so often in the thick of everything. I feel like that just like complicates their whole plot progression and narrative right. progression. So I'm sure like some of them are definitely going to get a little something. But it might be towards the later back half of this whole show because, like, they're they're just so much more involved in so many more episodes with so much more running around. Whereas Entrapped has like kind of been in a lab the whole time, right? The past couple seasons, so it's easier for her to hit up a, a romance than everyone else. But I don't know. Yeah, like I think there is an argument for like, well, is it because they're hetero that it's like easier and just feels like it would naturally happen versus any queer couple i don't know but it does seem like the show like it's trying to get in as many moments right. as they possibly can where it makes sense so i this definitely something to revisit once we get the end of the show but yeah, yeah I, th- totally. I think it's worth asking moving forward too because like yeah what if they're like i don't know i'm like second base by season four and Adora and Catcher and Scorpio just run around trying to kill each other. I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's, um, le- it's less like for me, it's less like whether or not they're trying to kill each other. It's more like if by the end of the series, Entrapped and Hordak kiss, but yeah, 
we don't see a kiss from a uh, from whoever it is at the other end. So whether it is Glimmer and Adora, Catra and Adora, Scorpio and Catra, whatever whoever it is in that side in that end, like if we're going if we see one do it but the other one not do it, right? Whether it's like it doesn't matter what point in the series. So like the Entrapta Hordak thing can happen earlier or later, whatever. But and maybe we're only gonna get at the end we're gonna get. So, Adora smooching someone, whatever it is. Like for me, it's more of that. Like I don't mind. You just if, want it to be equal. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I again, I don't need like, I don't need it to be like play by play the same thing or equal. You know what I mean? Because they're different characters. It's different things. They're different play. They're different points in their life. But I do think it's just worth noting, worth considering. Like. How are they going to how do how they deal with heterosexual a main a staple heterosexual couple versus a staple homosexual couple in the show? Because a lot of the the LGBT representation has been with side characters that are even smaller than Entrapped and Hordak. Like Entrapped and Hordak, I think, are gonna grow in importance as the show goes on. Whereas I don't know if Bo's dads are going to show up again. Yeah. Or like Natasha and Spinnerelle, like they're already an item. We haven't seen anyone just like start a gay relationship. So right. I feel like that's an important thing we do need to see come to some f- fruition. And like, again, Scorpio's trying her hardest to make that happen, but it's just yeah. not oh, in the Sc- cards right now. So. Oh man. Yeah. Give me, give me Scorpio. Like, trying to get like advice from like either oh Entrapped or Trapped. Please. Yeah, like, I think Entrapped like, gives great advice. She'd yeah. be a great person to ask. Look what oh, she said to Hordak. Totally rocked yeah. the world. And you and and Trapped and, and Scorpio already like bonded. Like you know yeah, later they're on friends. They're, they're friends. They hang out together. I'm just like Scorpio, like here is your 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 the 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 friend. Not the the romantic friendship, but just the solid friendship that you We're need hungry. right there. Gay buddy, please give her your advice. Yeah. She needs yeah. it. <laughs> but um, but I think. Uh, in- can, yes. oh, well, just 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 the, in, ter- in regards to the future of this. Uh, for, first of all, we shouldn't forget that at the end of the season, Katra lays out to Hordak, "Hey, and Trapta, let all these people in," and Hordak is broken. So, oh, like, I do- she's gonna figure out the truth, Alex. Yeah, like, may- gonna- maybe, maybe, oh, Hordak. Hordak- that well, is an evo- yeah, have a conversation Hordak. with her, and she'll be like, "Nah, son, that's a lie." I'll be like, oh, "Okay." Okay, but Hordak is a, is a vulnerable person, and I don't. Uh, I, I would like for him to make the right decision, but all I'm saying is that it's very possible that this gets delayed for a bit if we decide to go down the route of, "Oh, okay, I can't even trust Entrapta now, and I have to like figure out how to work by myself." So that 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 will probably have to be resolved at some point down the line, Maybe. and. Um, yeah, okay, and okay. Uh, and also I want to say with regards to like seeing this as a heterosexual romance versus the lack of uh, hom- homosexual romance elsewhere, I want to say that this relationship is portrayed, in my opinion, almost equally to Scorpio Catra in that we are only using the word friendship. So right. I mm-hmm. think that it's it's uh, it's probably an incorrect assumption on our part to be like, okay, this is a romance, but Catra and Scorpia isn't a romance. So like, I, I feel like it, it, it feels a bit to me like j- jumping the gun a little bit, be like uh, already talking about, like, oh, what happens if they like smooch at the end and the other people don't smooch? But it's like, I, I don't, this is a very close relationship. I enjoy the ship, but at, at the same time, I don't think that the show is giving this um, is giving this an elevated treatment compared to some of the other ships. In right? The ship. No, totally. I I, I, I think, right yeah, now, we're I think it, I think it's also more yeah. just like because we're all raised with heterosexual goggles on. It is. It's just also much easier to to, to like see this for what it is without them smooching. Be like, oh yeah, this is like. She's totally into him, and he sure seems to be swept off his feet by her, even literally with her hair. But, like, whereas, like, with a lot of queer ships, I feel like the fact that, like, the the friendship is such a device, so many more people can use that to claim it's not a legit romance. So that's, like, that's the only thing. It's, like, it's just so easy to believe that Hordak and Entrapta are like an item because like that's what we see all the time it makes total sense we don't have to think twice about it whereas like anyone else who's queer it's like 
but maybe they're just good friends because we're just not used to thinking about it as normal and that's like the the barrier to kind of mentally so that's why like i i agree with beatrice that it would have to be as explicit to feel like they're not prioritizing just because you have to jump over all these other hurdles with a queer relationship period just to make it feel more normalized than the you know designated hashtag normal so yeah. i I, mean, I hope yeah. somebody gets a smooch i just like I can see all the work they're trying to do to to authenticate everyone's relationships without that being a thing. I just don't want to take away from the work they're already clearly doing to lay the foundation. But we'll, yeah. we'll see. You. And I also want to just clarify, like the what we were talking about wasn't saying like, oh, they're an item already. They're not. Right. I was they're just not. pointing they're out, not. like because I was just pointing out, like, look, this is. This is a heterosexual something that's in that's bubbling, <laughs> and other stuff has been bubbling that yeah. is homosexual. And we need to start dealing with like, and if coming and starting from this point on, if this is the direction that the show is going, we do need to be aware of how they treat both relationships, both types of relationships, and see how they're going to be, how explicit each is going to be. That is what we're saying because it's not like we're treating. We're not considering Scorpia asking and uh, uh, Catra out as like nothing other than romantic. Like it's romantic. There's no doubt about it. And the whole like you mean you're everything to me. That is a romantic line reading if I've ever heard one. Like that is wow. it. So it's like we are not denying that. We're just saying, hey, we need to be aware that this is a heterosexual couple. If they start treating them more explicit than every other relationship. That's something that we need to be worth, that needs to be talked about. That's something that we need to see going forward. I think the ultimate power move that uh, Noelle Stevenson can do is not have, uh, not have Hordak and Entrapped a kiss, not have the heterosexual couple kiss, but have the homosexual couple kiss. That would be super like power move. Um, not that I want, I don't want that. Cause I'm super, I'm like a shipper of them, but I'm just saying if she wants to be like, no, we're going to do like really explicit is going to be the gay couple. And then the heterosexual couple is not going to be as explicit. Then like that could, that could be something I could see happening just because of how society, just as Michelle mm -hmm. said, yeah. us, like, it's like, haha, well, you don't need to see them kiss. Cause you have your heterosexual couples. Exactly. We're going to be explicit with the other couple mm -hmm. because we need to prove it otherwise. So just letting you know, like that's what we were talking about. Not trying to diminish anything of the groundwork that has been set up for Scorpia and Catra and Scorp uh, Catra and Adora, whatever ship and maybe those are definitely seeds that are being planted as well. All right. So moving on to uh, because we do need to talk about prime we need to talk about horde prime for a bit because we do get hordex backstory his name um, is so silly horde prime like it's no tongue lash shore it's definitely the worst name you could have in the show but <laughs> horde prime's like pretty silly yeah i mean again we have cast a spell in the toss up like. <laughs> Oh man, that's true. Okay. But they're like, hmm, we need a lady who casts spells. What should we call her? Hmm, we need a lady who throws nets. We need who tosses nets. What should we call her? Come on. The guy who shoots arrows, Bo. Bo. Yes. Oh my god. So we have um Prime, who's who uh, we have this whole thing where he is the big bad. He is the main mm -hmm. bad. Um, and I can kind of see in terms of like, yeah, sure, like maybe not in season four, it, the whole Horde act, like the whole issue right now about like entrapped, like Ketra lying about entrapped and betraying Horde act. Well, like this could easily be solved with Horde act, Pro uh, Horde Prime coming in. Prime being like, you're still defective, throwing Hordak aside, and then Atrapta still being the one there to help him, like, to raise him back up, and him being like, but, but you betrayed me, and then I was so horrible, and then maybe he had found out along the way, and he goes, but I didn't believe you, and she goes, that doesn't matter, and then smooching. Oh. Oh. That would be great. That would be great. Anyway. Oh my god, if they, I just What's side that? note, if they smooch, I really hope that Atrapta, like, lifts his chin with her hair. <laughs> <laughs> to like lean in to smooch him and just hold his face with her hair. I just that seems like a very entrapped thing to do. That would be totally entrapped thing to do. I and I, I would hope maybe she <laughs> this, this is so fan fictiony, but I <laughs> hope that she maybe goes like like I like your lips because they're tiny. Oh, <laughs> <good> God. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god, and if he can't, I know he's kind of like a skeleton man, but like if he could blush, I hope he would blush right there. Oh then. man, that would be amazing. Um, he is a skeleton man. He's our favorite skeleton man. But okay, so <laughs> really Prime. We gotta talk about Prime. We gotta focus, focus. We gotta yeah, talk okay. about Prime. Yeah, so we he's know. like Emperor of the Universe. Is that his title? That's uh, you know but very presumptuous. <laughs> that's questionable though, because like for instance, it's like. He's he he gave himself that title, I'm assuming, of Emperor of the Universe. There probably is some planet that's like, he's not the Emperor of us. He's just this annoying guy who's trying to take over our planet and we're fighting back. You know what I mean? So it's like, is he the Emperor of the known universe or is that just something that he calls himself? Yeah, and like there are wars because our Hordak was thrown to the front lines of something. So they're they're fighting against something. Yeah, it's very Star Warsy this episode. No, it, it like just making an army of clones of you to take over the world feels very Star Warsy. But I'll go for it because, yeah, yeah. It, it does make. I mean, I remember I was fighting really hard against um in the initial reactions for the season of like, oh, Hordoff's not off the hook for being a mass murder because he is still kind of that. But the fact that he he was crowned in like a test tube for the sole purpose doesn't give him a lot of options initially and i do think that does make him a little more sympathetic as a villain going forward and more likely to flip-flop sides honestly like yeah i I could see him walking away from like the horde at the end of the show honestly if he hasn't trapped it i mean what else does he need right yeah i can see it i mean it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of groundwork i think to Mm -hmm. like similar to with ketra it's gonna it's gonna it's, it's gonna take a lot of groundwork for him to let go of what has been for his entire life, his life's purpose, you know? So same for Entrapta, like, want, she was raised to be, like, to want to help the Horde take over the world, and she's she's just, poor Katra, she's got so much going on. But, um, but yeah. Uh, uh, I, that- I have a question. Um, it, the explanation of how he gets to the Ethereum is just that he's in the war, oh, yeah. and then a, port- yeah. a random portal just pops up. Yeah, what is up with that? Told, like, yeah. Just, what? <laughs> so, like, you know, like he and Adora have something in common. A random portal opened up, and they were both taken away from their home planets. So, well, not his home planet, but like his universe. So, here's a question: What did this all start? Because Mara, like, when she. Ooh. Ripped, when she ripped Etheria out from the universe and placed it in wherever it is, um, is this like, are we seeing like from this, like this portal that took uh, Hordak away, is it that maybe we, like what we saw in late in the later episodes with like how space and time are crumbling, are we seeing that also happening in the real time and like in the, in the universe where it's like random portals are opening up throughout the universe because what Mara did was so has such high repercussions that it, it bended time and space and it can't handle it. Ooh, maybe. Uh, I think that's definitely on the table, actually, now that you mention it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, because it's true. Like, he didn't ask to be sent to, uh, to Etheria. Like, he didn't, he didn't open that portal. He didn't, like, it's it's crazy because uh, for the longest time I thought it was that he somehow got in or he got trapped here after trying to colonize Etheria for the Horde. And it was while all this was happening that Mara ripped it out and he just got stuck here. That's what I always assumed. Oh, maybe, yeah. But, but then this told us that that's not the case. He was at some place else and then a portal sucked him into Etheria. I think Ethereum is just making all these portals into all these different pockets of dimensions at the same time, maybe. Well, maybe not, actually, because I guess Hordak, he went through a portal, then he built the Horde, and then at some point when the Horde was already established, they found Adora as a baby. But maybe, I don't know, maybe the timelines got mixed up. So, like, technically all the portals did open at the same time, but then time got weird and it manifested in a later, I don't know. But no, I do like I the think, idea that Mara's involved. But I do, but I do. I think that he did open a portal. It, like Light Hope said, he opened the portal and took Adora. Right? Did he, oh wait, no, you're right. Yeah, so maybe the first round was Mara's portal. And he's like, well, a portal brought me here. A portal can take me out. 
And then they made a test portal and it barely worked. And then a door popped out. And he's like, what? What? And then, yeah. Yeah. That, that it, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Or, or, I mean, granted, this is based on what Light Hope said. Maybe it just another portal opened. And he was like, well, maybe I can get through. But there was only room for a baby. So he just took the baby. I don't know. I don't oh, know what Hordak was thinking for taking the baby. <laughs> like, why? If you open a portal to try and get some a message out but instead just decide to take a baby. Like, I don't understand his logic for why he took Adora. That is something we need to explore. just popped out. Maybe he reached his hand inside, and then he came back with Adora, and he's like, what? And then it closed, and he's like, okay, I guess, well, we can at least use her for the army or something. Right. Do you, does, anyone, does anyone remember when, in, the, in, in season two, when we get that flashback to Shadow Weaver getting Adora for the first time, mm-hmm. does what does he does Hordak say that she's useless? Does he say something along the he lines just, of like, yeah, he says just, like, I don't care what you do with her, and and Shadow Weaver says like, there's like power coming off power this baby, can you yeah. not feel? And he's like, I literally don't care, Shadow Weaver. Right. <laughs> and so, so, so she just takes Adora. To. No, yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't th- I don't know if he was even like I don't even I think the Adora kidnapping was an accident maybe. Like he was that wasn't supposed to happen. No. But yeah. destiny has its ways of making things happen. Um but but yeah, that's that's all that happens in these two episodes. I think we covered a lot of it. Are there any other things you want to you want to say guys before we wrap up? Um, I, I know we, we pushed past the Huntara stuff, but I at least will give the compliment that the fights between Huntara and Adora is pretty good. Like them sword yeah. fighting, like that, that whole choreography is pretty, the, the she theme is like playing an electric guitar while that's happening. So that, that's, yeah. that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, Sh- Shadow Weaver is cool. Um, I, I love that she like, uh, picks at, uh, Angela and casts a spell, like getting under their skin very easily yeah. mm-hmm. like uh, th- there's the running gag of, like this is a prison uh, th- th- <laughs> yeah. that, that's pretty good and so bringing up Micah is all like in your face so Shadow Weaver is a, a queen of sass and I like that and uh, and yeah the w- one final Hordak and Trapta thing that we did not mention at the very beginning of the episode they're testing the portal and Trapta is going towards it to yeah. turn it off yeah. Hardak is like, no, it grabs her hand and then covers yeah, her when it blows her. up. It's, 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 it's a very protective pose and it's very, very loving. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, again, this just shows how effective they are of showing through action, through very quick instances, that Hordak cares. And then yeah. and that chapter cares. It's just very effective storytelling. I just, well done show. Well done. Um, Michelle, what about you? Anything, any last minute things you want to say? I love that. So Shadow Weaver is like presumably dying. She makes the steel the door like, oh yeah, like I'll totally tell you why I'm here once you heal me. She gets healed and then we're waiting for the big reveal. Just like, honestly, I had nowhere else to go. Yeah. Hordak, Hordak pissed me off and now I want to take him down. And this seems like the easiest way to do that. And it's like so funny. Her whole delivery is so funny. And she's like being completely honest. Like I totally buy that this is why she's here. But it's just like hilarious how flip floppy she is and i just i don't know i have a lot of admiration for her she's a terrible mother figure but like i have a lot of admiration for her character you know what i love that you said presumably yes, i know i'm trying to i got you. into you i'm so no, much no, out of no, your head i'm pretty sure she was like glimmer thought so Glimmer's mom thought so. I mean, I feel like enough people have reinforced it. But, like, I'm willing to throw you bone. <laughs> sure. That's all I asked. Wow, all wow, asked. such <laughs> condescension. Um, no, but- plus, Tara is like, I will say, like, Scorpia up to this point is the only one we've gotten who's like pretty muscular and like big lady butch. And now we have Atara, so we have two. And they have pretty distinct, different personalities. Yeah. And Katara was redeemed. So she's, like, not even a bad guy anymore. So that's great. Because we need, if we're going to see more butch ladies, we can't make them all evil. I mean, Jasper started us in a great place. But Jasper, like, it's not the end of the story. And and Scorpia is such a good... <laughs> Like Gen Two of Jasper in terms of her butchness, and I feel like Kantar is getting us to an even better place. So, you gotta see positive butch representation. 
So hooray for Hatara. I also will say, um, I'm I'm so glad that she's older. Because, yes. you know, with 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 uh, a lot of people were like, oh, well, like Angela is obviously like an adult. But it's like, yeah, well, Angela and, and Trapta, for instance, in terms of age, you could say that they're like similar in age in terms of how like how they've aged. They don't look old, you know, mm-hmm. whereas whereas with Entrapta and uh, Entrapta with Antara, like you are seeing someone who who has wrinkles and it doesn't and it's like it, they're beautiful you know what I mean and you don't see that like usually when you think old woman you think of 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 what's her name Raz Maz oh Raz. god Raz yeah you know so <laughs> so like that's what I mean it's like often you see old lady you think Raz so it's mm. like you don't we don't see like 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 just a, an older woman who's super fit and super attractive and it's like and it's someone and it's Gina Davis you know like of course <laughs> Thank um, you for that. so um I just I really appreciate that and I do want to say one thing that I don't understand I don't understand this choice um and tell me if when you saw it you felt a little uh strange so when She-Ra is giving her speech to Antara, trying to convince her to join the rebellion. She holds her chin. She like lifts her chin mm. or something. And I'm like, why? Why? Why are you touching her face? Like, it's like, I don't know. I, just, I it's, feel it's, like it's a weird power move, but I never like when people do that, especially not with couples, because yeah. it's like, don't grab their face. You're going to get the pimples. Like, what are you doing <laughs> but like and this is, is i think it was just like a power move thing like i got your face because you're at my mercy now and i'm gonna convince you to to do this thing i guess yeah i don't know i don't know like for me it was like i mean like i don't mind if someone just like tenderly like holds like your face with both their hands and like thumbs like caressing your cheek like i don't mind that <laughs> i what i mind is just like this weird it was just like a one-handed holding the chin up like as if lifting her head but like she is also at her level so she doesn't really need to lift her head anywhere I'm just like why are you holding her face like that it was just such a very awkward positioning physically that I was like they I don't I don't know what the point of that was like I I, I don't know if, it, if, it, if she wanted to if it want if she wanted it to be a power move she should have used her sword instead. Oh yeah, just like Catra, she should have learned. Yeah, exactly, you know. But I don't think she was trying to be. If she wanted to touch her, she could have just like you know put put a hand on her shoulder or something. I don't know. It was just a very a weird hand positioning. I just needed it out there for people to also notice and talk about with me. Um, Alex, they I don't know if you have any, any opinions about the hand. I don't, <laughs> do you I don't, I don't remember this scene, so I cannot cut. <laughs> okay, okay, gotcha. Oh, okay, okay, so final question. Where do you rank these two episodes with the rest of this season? Oh, that's hard. Hmm. I really uh, like Hantara. I mean, that's one of maybe my top three episodes of the season, but there's only like six episodes this season. Right, now. right. Okay, well, better yeah. question. In terms of like the rest of the show, like all the episodes, where oh. do these two rank? Like mid tier, I'm not even asking for a specific place. And just tell me, like, how each one, if each one's a low tier, mid tier, high tier episode. Well, look, I, I pulled up my rankings for the uh, the go. year, so I have uh, season two and season three in here. So, uh, Huntara, look, if it was just the uh, Trapta and Hordak stuff, that would probably be really high. But because it's also mixed in with some other stuff that's like okay and there's a lot of good episodes in this season i think it's probably bottom half of, of the season but it's still good like all these episodes are good no matter what but if you're just like comparing them to each other like i think this is bottom half but i really enjoy the the prize of power because of like the shadow weaver focus along with like the little sprinkles of uh hordak and trapped at the beginning in the background and catra as well so like i think that that all comes together and makes it a very like one of the top episodes of the season but again stressing all of the episodes of the season are good. So even a bottom half episode is still like a top 50 episode overall of like the year. So it's just, the, the, these are all good. But I'm just, I would take the price of power over Huntara as a whole. Gotcha, gotcha. What about you, Michelle? 
I think they're both upper mid tier. Like they're pretty close to the top of mid tier, but they haven't quite cracked the top tier. Just because, like, if we're well, if we're doing it from like the whole whole show, I think there there are definitely some standouts season two and one that I think are slightly better as a whole. Yeah. But like these are like very close, so it's it they're like B plus A minus territory. It's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah, I kind of I agree. I they're they're highly entertaining. Um, I think that there are other episodes in the series overall that just Mm -hmm. the way that they're storyboarded, the way that they, the way that they are framed and the way shots are created within them that just are are just superior in terms of the quality, but in terms of entertainment value, this is very high. Um, And yeah, so I, I agree mid tier. I don't know if they're like the best. I, I I personally enjoyed. I don't care much for Shadow Weaver, so um, the Huntara episode for me was much more enjoyable. Also because vindication, but vindication. Uh, <laughs> but but yeah. So it, uh, mid to high tier, but not the top um, of high tier. If we're getting into that realm. Okay, so that does it for us. You can find out all the info on this podcast at OverlyAnimated.com. You can join us on Discord to text chat about animation at OverlyAnimated.com slash Discord. You can support us via Patreon at Patreon.com slash OverlyAnimated. Thanks to all our current patrons, especially our patron of the podcast, John. And thanks, as always, to our Patreon executive producers, Ryan, Steve, Alex, Beatrice, Hugh, Michael, and Needle. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.